Greetings, my esteemed audience. Welcome to the greatest interview of all time. This is the first time I'm actually doing an interview, and we have a very special guest. Now, a quick disclaimer before we get straight into it. Styx and I are not affiliated politically in any way. This is merely a conversation I wanted to have on a personal note. And the the backstory here is that some of you... Well, many of you hopefully have read my book reviews and I have touched upon the topic of the occult quite a few times in many of the books. And one of the the uh, reoccurring topics then is Satanism. And I thought to ask Styx here what Satanism is. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, Styx, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me on. So to uh, yeah get straight into it, if you so for me personally, as I said, I have only over the last year I've gotten a bit more acquainted with the concept of uh, Satanism. But if I were to ask you, or if someone without any previous knowledge whatsoever asked, what is Satanism? How would you how would you introduce it? I would say that, uh, well, the form of Satanism that I was involved with, and this is, you know, a decade ago at this point, it's vanishing into the past. Uh, the form of Satanism I was uh, in was independent, number one. I never jo- I joined any specific, like, satanic order or anything cringy like that. Uh, and it was fundamentally atheistic. So with, with LeVay and other similar Satanists, what you're getting is basically godlessness with a floor show. Uh, what LeVay did is he sort of made a mock-up of Catholic ritual specifically and sort of inverted some of the meanings, appropriated the cross of St. Peter uh, to an extent, and then did his various rituals. And to him, it was mostly a corporate scam, but it was basically a satire of, of the Christian religion and Catholicism, especially with his particular path. What I came to the conclusion of <clears throat> is that a, uh, Satanism, at least in the atheistic sense, Uh, is really more of an initiatory step. Um, So what I used it for basically was I had left religion, I had become atheistic, I still wanted ritualism and things like that. And it sort of dawned on me that it's sort of an initiatory framework in order to purge false guilt and and fear through psychodrama and through mock-up rituals. And then once things are cleared out, then you can go on and study more authentic magic and things of that nature, which is actually spurned by the Church of Satan. Uh, I got regarded, uh, I remember one time contacting Peggy Nadramia, their PR spokeswoman, which is hilarious, and being called an occultnik uh, for merely asking questions (laughs) about the topic of magic uh, at the time Mm -hmm. as a a somewhat cringy dude, uh, barely in his 20s. And I thought that was very funny. Yeah. So you would say that... Uh, you said that you you came from a religious background. Uh, is that correct? Uh, well, religious in the sense that we were Christians, but in the nominal liberal sense. So you go to church on Christmas and Easter, you read the Bible, you pray the Lord's Prayer at night, and that's kind of it. There was no larger religion. Later on in my teens, I became more religious for several years before I abandoned that in favor of at first hardline atheism and then later other things. Ah, right, right. Yeah, I suppose uh, many guys have had their atheist stage. So essentially, you went from regular Christian that, yeah, many, many people are grown up with, uh, then atheism, and then you you wanted to get back to a bit more um, spirituality, uh, including rituals and stuff like that. Yes, definitely. Although, again, uh, it was liberal Christianity at first, and then for a few years, it was, I wouldn't exactly say I was a fundamentalist, per se, but it was definitely more religious, like we were going to church on every Sunday, being more into religion as a family. Yeah, this this was sort of a family event for me. It was led mainly by my mom. Uh, mm-hmm. She de- she decided she wanted to go to church and stuff, and, and I sort of was brought along. Uh, but it was all right. It was fun. And, uh, you know, you got picnics and stuff like that. So there's nothing wrong with a picnic. <laughs> all right. Nice, nice. Yeah. So for, for the context, you're grown up on the east coast of good old America. That is correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Vermont. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, I am grown up in Sweden, of course, perhaps a bit more atheist than than the United States. But when I grew up, we had still, you know, school ceremonies in uh in church so for christmas and for 
uh, for summer and stuff like that. Uh, a bit, a few ceremonies regarding Easter as well, but I mainly remember the Christmas ceremonies. So they weren't overly Christian in their nature, but we still got a nice, uh, nice sense of it. So anyway, I wrote a review a while back uh, of Lords of the Left Hand Path by Stephen E. Flowers, and in my review, I gave a, a first impression of Satanism, and basically what I wrote was that. As I see it, from a Swedish perspective, from a uh, semi-atheist, uh, as I grew up, as I'm not an atheist now, but from what I saw, it I saw that perhaps many Americans uh, that had grown up with a very strict Christian upbringing, they sort of revolted against Christianity, and therefore Satanism had a certain allure because of the inversion of Christian, as you said, uh, a mockery of a Catholic ritual that Anton LeVay did. Uh, would you say that's a good analysis? I would say that's definitely the case if you're looking at the 1980s, especially with the, the rise of the moral majority, the satanic panic, there was definitely an influx into not just the Church of Satan, but other groups as well, and independent Satanism, uh, and, and outright devil worship, which doesn't have anything to do with them, but it, it was part of it. Uh, yeah, I would say that there was definitely a rebellion aspect of it, sort of leaving behind the nifty 50s sort of leave it to beaver Americana mentality that was espoused effectively by the Reaganites and, and of course, the Tipper Gores yeah. later on into the 90s. Yeah, I would say that um, there's also another sort of resurgence that you have in the middle of the 2010s uh, with the Satanic Temple and groups like that. And again, uh, people mis misinterpret what they're doing, putting up like a Moloch statue or something like that, a Lucifer statue at a courthouse, uh, effectively was just a form of protest. These are not theistic individuals. They don't believe in a literal devil. Mm -hmm. So you would say that from from Anton LaVey and onwards, you have more of a... Um... A spectacle and not so much uh, not so much a deeper concern with the metaphysics of things yeah there's nothing metaphysical about uh, levey and satanism i remember boyd rice used to go to concerts he was a uh, one of the higher ranking members of the church of satan i think he's left them now or no longer particularly active he used to go up on stage with a shirt that said rape and uh, just say and do weird things all of the time just be as edgy as possible and i found it hilarious Ah, oh, right, right. Yeah, makes makes total sense. And I suppose that every society has uh, will eventually have a counterculture based upon the dominant culture. And I can definitely understand that. Yeah, maybe some people were fed up with the over the top Christianity and sort of revolted. Now, of course, for me personally, as as I view Satanism uh, in America during the eighties and and onwards. Yeah, it, it looks a bit cringe to to be perfectly honest. Um, then of it, course it can uh, be, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and I mean I'm not talking about the anyone who has a deeper metaphysical speculation about the nature of the first intelligence or whatever, but uh, I'm I'm talking about the more antinomian provocateur archetype. But I thought to ask you about the Temple of Set. So. Uh, Michael Aquino, if I'm not mistaken, he yes. uh, he stepped aside from the the uh, Church of Satan because he believed it was too uh, too little spiritualism and too much show. Uh, do you have any take on the Temple of Set? Yeah, basically, imagine the Church of Satan, but they re-inject some of like the secret society nonsense back into it. So instead of it being understood to be psychodrama, there's more of a facade of actual spirituality. But uh, Michael Aquino, who looks, you know, sort of like a Vulcan, I suppose, uh, he mm. took part of the Church of Satan's leadership with him. And, and later on, there was a re-schismatic movement of the Temple of Set as well. So as far as mm. I know, they're now <laughs> defunct because they only had maybe a few hundred members, I think, at peak. Oh, right, right. Yeah, these uh, this smaller <laughs> organizations, they usually go off into different splinter groups. It's sort um, of like comparing Dogecoin to Bitcoin. As <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So um, going back a bit further in terms of perhaps not Satanism, but I thought to ask you about your username. So Styx Hexnammer 666 and 666. Then I think about Alistair Crowley. Is that a, a person who have had some influence on you? Uh, no, not really. I'm not into Crowley. 
Okay, right, right. So the 666, is that just uh, is something you added to your um, uh, your username, or does it have a story, your username? Yeah, originally it was just Styx Hexenhammer. Um, I decided to get more edgy, though, anyway. Uh, you know, Styx is the river uh, in hell, or the marsh, rather, uh, from the Inferno and, and from that sort of lore. It's quasi-paganistic. Hexenhammer yeah. is is the hammer of the witches, the German term for the Malleus Maleficarum, famous mm-hmm. witch hunting guide. And then 666 uh, partially remains there only because it helps to prevent people with small minds from subscribing to the channel. So people yeah. who might look at the, the hazard that I run is that a lot of people mistake me for far right or conservative or, or moralistic. I've had people claim I'm a Jesus freak based on a tweet <laughs> that I make. What that helps to do is that I don't want people to com- come aboard see my political beliefs, and they're like, wow, I found this great YouTuber named Styx Hexenhammer. And then I make a video about religion, and they get all salty about it. And it still happens anyway, but I think that having the 666 in the username helps to to limit that. And so it uh, keeps things a little bit easier for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Actually, a fun, uh, fun little anecdote just for uh, from the other day. I posted to Instagram a picture of me at uh, a grotto for uh, Saint Birgitta of Sweden. So it's a medieval mm-hmm. saint. Uh, it had a cross in the background and I asked, have you read all of my book reviews in the post on Instagram? And for anyone who has actually read my book reviews, it's quite clear that I'm not a Christian, but many comments were saying, have you become a Christian now? And uh, that points to the fact that, and this is general advice for all content creators out there many people they only look at they give your content a quick glance and then they form an opinion uh so without reading anything just based on a title of a video or a or a picture they draw conclusions so i think it's a quite a good way uh, a good strategy for you to not have to deal with these people but yeah as you say you you will have to deal with them yeah uh, <laughs> anyway and a quick note here i'm not anti-christian in any way uh, for me on a personal note i have grown up in again a quite atheistic sweden so for me uh, in a fun sense all of these religious traditions so christianity and paganism they have in a sense, been on the same side. So you have had atheism on one side, and then you've had any belief system which has some sort of metaphysics in it uh, on the other side. So I haven't really viewed it as a conflict between the two, and I know it's completely different in um, for others who view paganism as a sort of response to Christianity. So I suppose that in the 80s, many people, they perhaps turn to Satanism as a response to Christianity, and I see how certain individuals they interpret paganism only as a reaction to christianity and on a personal note for me i appreciate paganism because it's older than christianity so i don't see paganism as being a reaction uh, to christianity at all so so they also they've co-evolved for a very long time so christian ritual is informed by paganism and at this point the neo-pagan movements oftentimes they draw from christianity or at least in the moral sense yeah, definitely, definitely. That's something to uh, to keep in mind when discussing Catholicism as well. And uh, for me, of course, Sweden has been Protestant for for five hundred years, depending on how we count it. But I view it as a as a source of sadness that uh, we went from the more pagan Catholicism to the more um, we can say purely Christian Christianity. Um, then, of course, as it is today, uh, mainly atheist. Of course, the Church of Sweden they still exist, but at this stage, they are. One could argue, one could say that they are more or less uh, just another arm of the Social Democratic Party, which has ruled Sweden on and off for uh, the last hundred years. So, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say the Church of Sweden today is. Um, particularly friendly to guys like me but uh i'm not <laughs> saying that christianity necessarily is uh, is all bad or anything that sounds like, like uh that. The, that sounds like the netherlands actually i mean there are quite a few churches here but they all seem to be tourist landmarks for the most part the be- i mean the bells are ringing but nobody's going to mass you know yeah yeah definitely same here uh and of course the um the the church they have adopted the general site guys and they cherry pick 
quite a bit from the Christian theology. So it's yeah, I, re- about- I remember when I was in Rutland the last time, there was a pride flag actually out in front of the Baptist uh, church in Rutland. Now, Vermont, of course, is a little bit oddball as far as religion goes. It's the most atheistic state anyway, and most of the Christians are liberal. But I thought it was funny that it was outside of the Baptist <laughs> church of all places. It's like, I, I, mean, I thought the Unitarians were the ones that did that. Uh, yeah, yeah, same, uh, same in Sweden. So, and this is also something I could just briefly uh, elaborate on, since we're on the topic of religion. So, I would say that. So, if anyone comes to Stockholm in July and they see pride flags all over the place, you could view, yeah, the pride flag, pride ideology as the main, as the dominant religion in Sweden, since Christianity has lost its role. But I do believe, at least, that our people will have a certain need for uh, a moral framework and a religion, something that you could adhere to. And now, of course, it's been uh, the, the pride ideology for, for quite some time. I'm, I'm not sure how long that will last, but certainly now that is how you should view it at least. So don't necessarily, if someone comes to, to Stockholm then sees all of these flags, don't necessarily view it as an expression of LBTQ rights, but more as an expression of religion, as an expression of adhering to the socially acceptable norms. Oh, and and also it'll uh, go away if it stops being profitable. So when they move on to the yeah. next zeitgeist, basically. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's something to keep in mind as well. That most companies and many institutions, the church in this case. They're simply following the zeitgeist and who determines the moral framework. I have <laughs> talked about this in Telegram posts, the uh, the moral framework, who controls it. Yeah, it's basically who uh, steers the ship in, in what direction. So yeah, moving on, I, I thought to just ask you about um, your own enlightenment journey. So if you could elaborate a bit on your on your belief in um, in the higher. Do you believe in God? <clears throat> Uh, I'm apatheistic with regards to a deity. That is, uh, I've just stopped thinking about it for the most part, and I'm more interested in tradition, in magic, the the occult in general, panoccultism, lore, history. I'm interested in it partially from an academic perspective, partially from a practitioner's perspective. But I don't think that it can be genuinely, objectively known whether there is a deity. And even if that could be proven, the form of that deity or that cosmic force pantheon, whatever you want to call it. So I don't really, I don't spend as much time thinking about it anymore. I'm not atheistic. I don't say that there is no God, God is dead. But at the same time, I'm not a theist. I don't say, well, there's got to be some higher power. I I simply don't know. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about magic, would you agree that there is a, what shall we call it, a, a metaphysical dimension that we can reach with our will and by accessing that power we can influence the, the physical realm, the, the reality as we see uh, in front of us. Yes, I would agree with that. I would also say to people, I mean, there might be someone who watches this who's more secular and more skeptical about these things. If you study uh, string theory and a few other elements within just physics, we're talking just mainline science, you can conclude from that if you interpret that material in certain ways that magic would be very, very real. It also could admit the existence of a deity. Yeah, yeah. So uh, on a related note, I'm actually writing on my second book now and I am elaborating in the book on the placebo effect, which I think is uh, supremely uh, interesting. So I suppose most of our listeners now know that I have been in the the gym world for uh, well for a decade or even more than a decade and of course I do own a supplement company so I I try to keep um, keep updated on the latest research and I will make probably a separate video on this but I will mention it here that the greatest supplement you can possibly take is the one you believe in so if you believe that a certain supplement will do a certain thing or even a uh, medication and you believe in it enough, it will have an effect. So this, and there are many studies showing this, by the way, uh, this tells me at least that, you know, you can do so many things via magic. Uh, If we use the term magic to denote, you know, uh, a change in the physical, so a change in your physiology, in your body, based on your own, what shall we say, metaphysical powers, so to speak. So, For someone who is skeptical, 
that is something too. That's a good starting point. That's actually one of these things that got me thinking about the um, uh, yeah the the magical side of things. So when I say magical, I mean a uh, change you can influence in the physical world via your your metaphysical, so to speak. So you enter um, a state of mind with your will. Uh, and who gives you your will? Perhaps God. I am not. Uh, I need to meditate more upon it. But uh, anyway, you can reach that, and you can influence the the physical. Extremely important when uh, when talking about things such as yeah supplementation or or training or or uh, whatever really. Yeah, it extends to the uh, idea of the iron will, just using sheer willpower to do things. I think that the effects that are caused by magic, which you know I've personally witnessed, so I have no reason to doubt them. I think they go beyond placebo effects and simple willpower. I think there's something considerably more unexplained there. But in many cases, yes, that would definitely be the case. And I, one thing I would say is I fail to see how putting, and I know you're not saying this, but I mean, some people do, uh, how putting one's iron will to a particular goal and causing mass change thereby, think of Napoleon or something like that, mm. uh, is really remarkably different from ritualism anyway. And if we look at some of the greatest thinkers and leaders of the world, an enormous proportion of them have at least dabbled with the occult. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, you have uh, you have dabbled in the occult yourself. Do you have any, How how did you start? Was it by meditation and stuff like that? Or was it via some grimoire, some sort of meditation you found, or give us, give us an origin story. Well, when I was a small child, I was visited by what, you know, Christians at least would colloquially term a demon, uh, specifically mm -hmm. Stolas, uh, giving me various inspiration. And uh, later on, when I sort of remembered about those experiences, because I had gone through, you know, the Christian phase, you're not going to, you know, do demonology as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And I went through the atheistic phase where I just sort of lost faith in anythingness. So you're not going to delve into magic there. I had I had an interest in uh, studying about it, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't have any interest in in really doing a deep dive. But when I sort of reconsidered, you know, my life and the experiences that I had, I said, well, there might be there might be something there. Uh, let's see what we can do. And I ended up uh, delving into occult literature. And that became the backbone of all of my success, really. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think people realize um, uh, up until, you know, starting streaming every day more recently, the bulk of all of my income has been related to books. It hasn't been related to video making. Ah, oh, right, right. I've, I've released uh, 400 different editions <laughs> on Amazon. Ah, oh, right. So uh, if I understood it correctly, you have written <clears throat> some books yourself and then you have edited previous works. Yeah, I've edited about 400 works, and I've got a, a half a dozen already done for the next slew of them, but I've uh, authored about two dozen works as well, a, a small number of uh, full-length works, a couple of fictional works, and mostly uh, my thoughts. And I, like, I did Fruits of Eden, which is uh, about uh, occult botany, basically, and uh, some political works, and then some funny satire works, like I did 101 commie jokes and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Critical race theory debunked, which which became a bestseller somehow. Oh, and, uh, right, right, yeah, right. I I have I have fun doing it, so I figure I'm going to keep a good thing going. All right, nice, nice. So, do you uh, do you do any special ritual? Do you do you pray to the muses to come and visit you with creative inspiration, or do you just have it uh, all the time? No, I just find it comes automatically, especially when I get into a goofy mood where I'm like having my jollies off thinking about deranged things. I find that's when I get my best inspiration. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So what would you say for anyone who is listening to this, who thinks, you know, this occult stuff, magic, it sounds interesting. If you could give a few a few book recommendations to start with to to get a good, yeah, a first, uh, a first step into the occult, what would you say? Yeah, if they're interested in magic in general, you can do a deep dive and get free digital material on archive.org of basically every description. So think about something related to magic like alchemy, um, black magic, um, Shintoism. It doesn't matter. Any, any religion, any anthropological subject either, just search for it on archive.org. And then you can potentially find uh, hardcover or paperback copies of those works if you're interested in perusing them physically. I would say uh, The Black Arts by Richard Cavendish is a good one. The Book of Ceremonial Magic by A.E. Waite, uh, that's an old classic, originally under a totally different title that was uh, 
released uh, by Delorance, and uh, I can't remember, I think it was called the Book of Black Magic and of Pacts or something, and had a bunch of filler, and Waite was probably flipping out at the time. Uh, Occultism for Beginners by William Dower. That's a theosophical work, but it delves far beyond the realm of just core theosophy. So, and I would, and theosophy, I would say, oh, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Just to clarify, theosophy <clears throat> is the the teachings of um, Madame Blavatsky, correct? Yeah, and later on of others, Annie Besant, notably. All right, and Veti is um, is the found is the well, perhaps not creator, but he has a, a famous tarot deck, correct? Uh yes. All right, right. Okay, sorry for uh, for interrupting. Do, do oh, no, I, oh, no, I was just going to say that I've also released a number of compilational works that take some of the works that I've edited and compress them together. Like there's a compilation for alchemy. There's a compilation for demonology, specifically from the more historical and academic perspective on that one. Mm. Um, folk, folk medicine, folk magic and incantations. Uh, I released those because I realized I had this vast core of literature and it made sense to make some full length work so these are 3 400 pages in length oh right right so uh, since you mentioned alchemy um i, I thought to uh, to ask you about it um i read the hermetic tradition by julius evola a while back i had to reread it directly upon finishing it it was quite uh, quite heavy quite <laughs> uh, hard to uh, to get through but uh, is that something you have uh, delved into as well alchemy yeah, I have a deep interest in alchemy. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what I would say is what I've what I've come to the conclusion of is that virtually all alchemical works fall under one of two banners. There are works about chemistry that use spiritual language as a mask. So there, mm-hmm. so I- instead of talking about uh, decanting the spirit, you're talking about the ascent of the angels or something. Mm-hmm. And spiritual works, and this is converse. This is something that's not mentioned enough. Spiritual works that masquerade as chemical works. So you're, I mean, the two things are basically twain. I guess as above, so below applies here. Mm. In my opinion, virtually all alchemical works fall under one of those two banners. Now, there are just straight up chemical recipes and things like that. That's more notably what alchemy is regarded as. But I've noted that there are some works that appear to be telling more of a spiritual story, like uh, was it, uh, the Keys of Eudoxus, I think, is one of them. And uh, they're telling a spiritual story, but there's, there's chemical preparations or illusions that are made. And it's sort of like a masquerade. It's cryptography of a sort. Mm. To, to be clear, I don't think that most of these people were actually attempting to turn uh, other substances into gold. They were making other useful chemical preparations, universal medicine or elixir or its precursor, Ixir, uh, and others. Uh, there was a fascinating work about the ever-burning lights of Trithemius um, by a third party. I can't remember uh, which author it was by that was talking about some of these uh, sort of glow lamps that they had that for centuries would continue to give light. And it looks almost like uh, they they developed a the primitive concept of phosphorescence or some sort of slow chemical reaction at the time. It's not entirely clear. Mm-hmm. I remember a uh, work of Saturn by Hollandus, which was talking about uh, using lead uh, as a medicine and sort of melting it down into wine and <laughs> drinking it. Uh. <laughs> and this will sweat out the fever. And I'm thinking, yeah, of course it will. <laughs> So uh, speaking of uh, Julius Evola, have you read many of his books, by the way? No, I haven't. Okay, right, right. Because one of these reoccurring, he has a few themes which they they come up in many of his works. And one of these takes he has, uh, as opposed to the uh, the takes of René Gounon. So Evola says that the red work in alchemy, so the, the more warrior element, is uh, the highest Whereas René Guénon uh, puts the the contemplation of the priest caste uh, on top in, in the hierarchy. So Evola, he points to the Roman emperor being both emperor and pontifex maximus. So a combination of the, the spiritual and the temporal. Uh, and Guénon then being perhaps a bit more bookish than Evola. Evola being of the Kshatriya, the warrior caste. Guénon claims that the, the contemplation of the Brahman uh, is the highest. Do you have any any take on these matters? Yeah, I think that if you're going to have a pragmatic society capable of functioning, then both would be important. You need a warrior caste to defend from various threats. Uh, simply contemplating them is not going to make them go away. And then those warriors will need a form of morality or order uh, that would be uh, from without, uh, generally speaking. 
I would say that ultimately the most important would be the uh, the peasant class, though, because they're the ones growing all the food and an army marches on its stomach and the priests need something to offer at the altar. This is too often forgotten. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That is true. Uh, and uh, disclaimer here as well that um, I thought to mention, since I've reviewed so many of Evola's works, I will say that I, I don't agree with all of his takes. I have said this as well in at least one review that, of course, I, I'm a bit more um, um, sympathetic to the common man than Evola. Of course, he had his perspective as an aristocrat. Evola has very many interesting esoteric teachings, but his social and political takes aren't always uh, perhaps the most reasonable. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I just thought to mention that. But anyway, talking about um, Hinduism, or perhaps I shouldn't say Hinduism, perhaps I should say Vedic spirituality. Uh, <laughs> I saw that you talked about it in, in a recent video, actually. You talk, talked about some uh, occult of the left-hand path uh, in, in India. Would you, uh, would you just care to introduce the, the right-hand and left-hand path to anyone who isn't familiar with the terms? Yeah, right and left hand path. The, the right hand path is orderly religion. It's prescribed, it's exterior, it's going to church and things of that nature. The left hand path is more individualistic and can seem more drastic. It would be returning to Hinduism. It would be like con uh, comparing the average Hindu worshiper. Okay, they have their Hanuman statue or Ganesha or they pray to Shiva. They pray and they go to the temple and leave the flowers or the money or something and, and try to do good charitable works and stuff. That'd be very right-hand path. It's prescribed. It's very orderly. The left-hand path would be the Agori, who have decided, no, screw that shit. And they've just decided to burn out all guilt, all fear, and all, all negativity from themselves by having absolutely no guilt and fear and simply not allowing it through sort of dissociation, through flagellating themselves, urinating on one another, <laughs> Im imbibing drugs, cannibalism, uh, dwelling in charnel grounds. They literally smear funeral ashes on themselves. Mm -hmm. They're considered very holy by some of the lower classes, especially in rural India. And what they do is they're practicing effectively what, what is referred to as a shabha, meditation mm -hmm. on, on the corpse. For instance, uh, conceiving of yourself in the state of death still aware enough to feel crepitation, to feel rot and decay and to go cold, because that will happen to the average person who dies unless they're vaporized or something in an explosion. Mm -hmm. uh, and for, and I hate to tell people this, but you're going to feel the early part of your physical death um, in bursts, in, in little bursts and spurts, and it won't be pleasant. Uh, mm -hmm. If you meditate upon the, the inevitability of that fact before you die, at least you won't be afraid of it. The Agori simply take that uh, hyperbolically, like on steroids, and they don't care about their physical bodies. Uh, they Again, they do bloodletting and, and crazy stuff. They assault one another and they do it freely. Uh, yeah, I am... Um... I, I suppose it's uh, it's one way to reach the divine, perhaps not the the, the path I would take, but uh, <laughs> each to his own. So uh, basically, if I understood correctly as well, that <clears throat> left-hand path uh, is more about um, antinomian, controversial social behavior, uh, and right-hand path is to just stick to, to dogma. Is that correct? That's that's sort of what it pertains to. The left-hand path invites experimentation and magic and things like that. The right-hand path says there is a prescribed form of spiritual ritualism, and you must adhere to that alone. Mm -hmm. So I suppose you are, um, without being an, um, a, a Hindu, a, a Gora, uh, you still believe that the left-hand path is a, a good path to take for anyone who um, wants to explore the, the occult today. I don't think that it's a good path for just anyone. I think people should, I think for the average person, the right hand path is the right way to go mm. um, because the average person is not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to make any use of the left hand path. It requires personal experimentation and awareness on a level that a lot, uh, a lot of people don't have the time to practice. They have to, mm. they, they, they want to do their normal nine to five and things like that. The, the left hand path is much more independent. So yeah. unless, a per unless a person is in a very independent position, like I happen to be, and has that sort of, you could say, Luciferian or Promethean drive towards these things and can't live a, a normal right-hand path existence spiritually, 
Mm. They probably should just go to church or something like that. Yeah, makes perfect sense. So moving on to more practical applications, do you have any sort of uh, meditation, daily routine, anything of the sort? Yeah, I meditate. Uh, when I lay in bed at night, specifically, I do some physical meditation, just sort of being aware of the different parts of my body as I start to fall asleep. And sometimes this can aid in lucid dreaming. So mm. it's uh, something that I've taken up over the last few months. I've, ne I've never been able to meditate to sound like, you know, oh, f breathe in, breathe out, hear the sound of your breath. Let your mind wander or something like that. Uh -huh. I, I, because I'm an ADHD kid, so I could never get the hang of that. But what I did find is that if I focus on the tangibility of my body, like the sensation of its existence, I can do that. Ah, right, right. So, so you haven't, you aren't a fan of the uh, Wim Hof breathing exercise? No, it doesn't work for me at all. Ah, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, how about the chakras? Is that something you uh, you meditate upon? So, activation of the chakras. I'm more interested in the self-awareness that comes with it, but I did have an interesting experience, one on mescaline, uh, mm -hmm. actually, if I, I can describe that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sounds interesting. Yeah, uh, when I took mescaline the second time, this was, again, years ago, so don't worry, the statute of limitations is closed on my drug use by now. <laughs> uh, I was a college kid. I was confused. Yeah. Um, I, I took it, and uh, I felt this weird tingling all up and down my spine, and like I was seeing hallucinations, because you know I took mescaline. I almost was ignoring them because of the physical sensation, and it really did align with sort of the chakra thing, because mm -hmm. it was exactly those same points that felt like they were vibrating or being massaged sort of like inside of the, of the flesh itself. I thought it was great. All right. Yeah, sounds, uh, sounds nice. So speaking of this, um, I suppose you could call it corrosive waters in uh, alchemical terminology. Uh, would you say that these type of drugs, are they uh, a shortcut to uh, to certain uh, states of mind? Do you think you could reach these uh, sensations even without drugs? Um, they're not a shortcut to any full enlightenment, but they can be a starting point because they can sort of change the way in which you think about things. A lot of people, mm -hmm. they won't believe in magic or even regular spirituality because they don't believe that it's possible. Mm -hmm. But then you give them psilocybin. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they see the frogmen dancing around, or you give them <laughs> DMT and they meet God or machine elves, all of a sudden that changes the way in which they think about the world. Admitting the possibility makes it possible with regards to spirituality. Otherwise, you can achieve absolutely nothing. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. So same thing with this uh, ayahuasca, mm -hmm. I believe it's called. Yeah, mescaline won't open your chakras, but it can give you a sensation that lets you know that something akin to that basic concept is physically possible to have as an experience, thus meaning that you can potentially get yourself to experiment further with meditation, yogic practice, whatever you happen to be doing. All right, right. So uh, last question, which religion or uh, metaphysics would you say that you're most... Uh... Uh, most akin to or uh, which which religion do you feel makes the most sense to you as a person i don't think any organized religion makes sense mm -hmm. <laughs> just i am i am still i may not be anti-theistic i'm not against spirituality but i am against the existence of organized religions from the left hand path the organized side is all basically the same there's mm -hmm. good and there's bad in all of them the problem is that organizational structure creates corruption and uh -huh. corrupt people will tend to be drawn to that centralized corruption the same way as, as having a too powerful state uh, corrupts itself and collapses over time. When I see uh, churches, I see wonderful architecture, mm. but it's being inhabited by charlatans mainly, the same uh, mosques mm -hmm. and synagogues and uh, temples, even as a pagan. Uh, I would say t pagan temples are the same way. You look at some of Satru Folk Assembly, it sets up a longhouse or something. They've built a beautiful longhouse with ornate gardens. They've got their sacred groves and rocks and all sorts of wonderful things that are very nature-like. And of course, the more closely it approximates nature, the more I'm going to like it. Mm -hmm. But then you go inside and, and you see someone with pink hair uh, preaching about uh, diversity quotas, possibly. Uh -huh, right. or, or maybe there is a skinhead and they're telling you to hate other groups of people and insinuating that maybe something should be done about them. Uh -huh. And uh, it's it's that level of corruption that keeps me away from any organized religion. I would say as far as the founding doctrines of religion, I'm interested in them all. Uh -huh. um, Christianity, Islam, especially Sufism, 
uh, and mystic Judaism, Hinduism would be a big one for me, but I'm not interested in any of the religions themselves in the uh, structural sense. Right, right. So I will just note, though, that I I don't know everything about them, but as far as I know, the Asatru Folk Assembly are good people, though. So I, I will just say that as a yes, as a I was just using a, I was just using a, an example. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I I completely understand, and <laughs> and I understand that you mean um, organized religion. Uh, yeah, generally, I do know that there are neo pagan groups that are very much woke. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I have encountered them uh, myself, and of course they uh, they make me angry. Well, not angry because I don't let them uh, influence my own mental landscape. I think you make them more angry than them. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably I do, I do. So uh, yeah, just uh, just a note on uh, Kabbalah. Uh, is that something you have uh, any knowledge of? Yes, yes, I like Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. mystic judaism gematria associated with the uh, mystical uh, numeric practices although there are so many different subsystems of it it's almost impossible to actually study because you have to pick the right one for any historical work all oh, right right so uh, if someone wants to read about the kabbalah is there any good starting place um, unless you really want to really get deep into an occult system that is extremely complex and convoluted, I would choose something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but read, read the Sefer Yetzirah, I would say. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. I know you have fatherly duties to attend to, so uh, <laughs> I, will, uh, I will stop with the, with the questions now. But thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And uh, yeah, I have uh, sated my curiosity. Very nice to get your take uh, on things. And uh, hopefully it's been enlightening to all of our listeners as well. So uh, where to find you? I suppose most know where to find your YouTube channel, Stux Hexenhammer 666, and of course on Odyssey uh, and on the other uh, video platforms as well. Same on Twitter. Uh, are you on no, any I'm, other? I'm Stix, I'm Stix 666 official on Twitter. The original handle was uh, sat upon by a, by a fan of mine and uh, <laughs> we fell out of contact. So it's just uh -huh, right, right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That is noted. So any any other place people should know of? Yes, yeah, since we're talking about the occult and things like that, if you are interested in paperback editions of some of those major occult works, you can visit the Tarl Warwick Books blog. Uh, that's on Blogspot or on WordPress. And all of those are links to Amazon. There's different categories, and I've tried to organize it as much as possible. All right, awesome. I will link the I will link your homepage uh, in the first link in the description box. You can Check that out if you're interested. And uh, yeah, with that being said, I would like to thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Anytime. All right. Perfect. XOXO. Boom.